This lecture video is looking at James P. Sturba's argument reconciling anthropocentric and non-anthropocentric environmental ethics. His thesis is that when the most morally defensible version of each of the perspectives of anthropocentric and non-anthropocentric uh, non environmental ethics are laid out, they do not lead to different practical requirements. So it's an acknowledgement that, look, in theory, yes, right? Anthropocentrists who have a human-centered ethics, non-anthropocentrists who have a non-human based, uh, you know, maybe universalist um, based ethics, theoretically, they're different. And most often, right, the kind of practical solutions each of them offers is going to be uh, uh, different, right? Should we, you know, is it immoral to eat meat? Uh, should you be vegetarian? How should you um, think about pollution, climate change, um, all other kinds of actions um, regarding the relationship between humans and, you know, the, the wider uh, environment. And yet, Sturba is going to try and show there is actually a kind of um, reconciling theoretically that can be done between them, where there can be three principles he's going to show that they can both share, which will actually lead to um, them being united in their practical requirements towards the environment. So non-anthropocentrism ar argues that members of species differ in a myriad of ways, right? So it's not to say that um, we're all ultimately the same just because, you know, uh, if we're sentient, for example, it's to say no, right? Each kind of sentient species has differences insofar as how they relate to the world, um, what they require to survive, uh, what their capabilities are, and so on. But these differences do not provide grounds for thinking that the members of any one species are morally superior to the members of any other. In particular, then, non-anthropocentrism denies that any particular difference or trait humans possess can provide grounds for thinking that humans are superior to the members of other species. And the reason is pretty simple, right? How is it that humans are going to argue they are superior? Well, they're gonna use, you know, they're gonna to have to give an argument, so they're gonna use logic, which uh, is made possible by reason. Well, if you're going to use reason to argue why humans are superior and say we possess reason, the only way you can do so is, to, and, and show that it is reason that makes us superior, is to use reason. So it is circular. So there is no non-question begging standpoint from which to justify that claim. Because we can never, right, get some kind of uh, non uh, some some kind of human independent view to you know measure the moral worth of each of the things that makes possible uh, that that each species um, you know defines them by so maybe with humans as reason animals you know the sentiments are perhaps stronger at least that's traditionally what is claimed but we cannot have any kind of um, human independent view from which to judge them. And if that's the case, we're always going to be falling back on our own capacities to judge why our own capacities are superior. And there's clearly a, uh, a fallacy, a question begging, a question -begging fallacy um, going on there. Um, you know, most famously, you're going to have the argument, for example, by the uh, consequentialist Peter Singer as to why um, we should give non-human animals equal moral uh, worth because their interests um, are, are, are no less valuable than our own. So how is it possible then to actually reconcile um, this view um, that there is nothing morally um, more worthy for human beings than non-human um, animals or any other sentient being. How, how is it that you can have a reconciliation between that theoretical position and any kind of an anthropocentric, um, you know, ethics, which is human-centered, which says, no, we begin from um, human interests. We begin from what distinguishes human beings. Well, Sturba is going to say that regarding the members of all species as equals, it still actually allows for human preference and self-preservation. And the reason is actually pretty simple. Serb is going to say, look, if we say we have to give, um, you know, the, the uh, interests of other non-human animals equal weight, moral weight as our own uh, human interests, 
He's going to say, well, that means then human interests are no less valuable than the interests of any others, such that it wouldn't be the morally right thing to do to allow human beings, for example, if they're attacked by a bear, to just let the bear um, kill themselves. Because it's in the interest of the human being uh, to defend itself in the same way that all other animals, right, if they're being attacked, it's in their own interest to defend themselves. So there's nothing then from a non-anthropocentrist point of view which would say humans shouldn't be able to defend themselves against aggression. So he says this principle of human defense should be adopted by non-anthropocentrists, that actions that defend oneself and other human beings against harmful aggression are permissible even when they necessitate killing or harming animals or plants because it's to act in no uh, more and no less a way than how other animals act. He also says non-anthropocentrists have to adopt the principle of human preservation, that actions that are necessary for meeting one's basic needs or the basic needs of other human beings are permissible, even when they require aggressing against the basic needs of animals and plants. So it is, on a non-anthropocentric uh, view, Sturba argues, permissible to, for example, eat meat if you would die if you, you know, didn't eat meat. So let's say you were stranded in the woods, you didn't know if any of the, the berries around you were poisonous or anything like that, um, and yet there's a, um, a raccoon that you see going around, um, maybe a deer instead of a raccoon, uh, which is maybe better. Um, it would be morally permissible for you to kill the deer if you would otherwise starve, right, in that circumstance. Well, Sturba's going to say the same thing then, right? Any kind of aggression we would do um, is permissible if it's in self-defense and if it has to do with self-preservation. But that doesn't mean anything more than uh, meeting, our non -basic, uh, meeting our basic needs is justified. So, the principle of human preservation, for example, wouldn't uh, justify uh, the practice of, uh, you know, factory um, farming and things like that, right? Um, because human beings can survive on all the other kinds of, um, you know, crops um, that are grown, and, and, and factory farming is a, a um, non-basic um, pleasure, a luxury good that humans enjoy. So, Sturber thinks that non-anthropocentrists have to accept those first two principles, right? The principle of self-preservation and the principle of self-defense. But, what about the anthropocentrist? He thinks that the anthropocentrist actually has to adopt what he calls a principle of disproportionality. That actions that meet non-basic or luxury needs of humans are prohibited when they aggress against the basic needs of animals and plants. So we saw why he tried to argue then, kind of more what we would typically think traditionally as like anthropocentric principles would have to be adopted by non-anthropocentrists. And here he's trying to say, look, a typically traditionally uh, non-anthropocentric principle would have to be adopted by anthropocentrists. That again, actions that meet non-basic or luxury needs of humans are prohibited when they aggress against the basic needs of animals and plants. So why is that, right? Uh, we'll look at some of his defense of this reason um, in a moment. But some of the implications that are pretty clear from this is that people in the first world ought to adopt a more vegetarian diet. That may be some um, amount of um, you know, meat consumption could be justifiable, but by and large, um, a more vegetarian diet ought to be adopted according to the principle of disproportionality. Now, you have to take into account, right, what might be the unintended consequences. One of these could be that, well, would the interests of farm animals be served well if um, people in the first world adopted this more vegetarian diet? Because you would clearly then have a dying out or maybe, you know, what, what do you do with all the, the farm animals that rely on humans um, to, to continue you know, keeping them alive, um, you wouldn't have their existence at all anymore, right? Is it more in the interest of a farm animal to exist for some amount of time than to not uh, live at all? So there are clear um, considerations that one has to take into account anytime you adopt some kind of a uh, uh, practical plan. So he says, in a completely vegetarian human world, 
it seems likely that the population of farm animals would be decimated, relegating many of the farm animals that remain to zoos. On this account, it would seem to be more in the interest of farm animals generally that they be maintained under healthy conditions and then killed relatively painlessly and eaten rather than they not be maintained at all. So a completely vegetarian human world would not seem to serve the interests of farm animals. So this is an interesting implication then. How would the non-anthropocentrist respond? Right? It seems unclear why they have to adopt the principle of self, human self-defense and human self-preservation if the principle of disproportionality is going to mean for the anthropocentrists, yeah, you can still eat meat sometimes. But what Sturber's trying to do is show, by and large, right, the reason why meat consum consumption might be permiss morally permissible is not because there's anything that is superior to human beings, but actually because you would be granting, as is currently the case now, more sentient uh, animals the right to exist and have experiences. Now, of course, the principle of disproportionality would demand that their conditions be much greater than they are um, in factory farms as they currently exist. But it still means that it wouldn't, you know, <laughs> this reconciliation of these um, uh, two uh, contrary views wouldn't require then that human beings, you know, have to live, um, you know, deny civilization and go back and live in like mud huts or something like that, right? That's kind of what Sturba is, is trying to show um, to appease to some extent, right, the anthropocentrists while still trying to show, look, even if we're per permitted to, to eat meat, sometimes it's still a largely vegetarian diet and the conditions that animals are, are held in have to be much, much better. Both, he thinks, uh, non-anthropocentrists -anthrop and anthropocentrists would have to agree to this. But why agree to the principle of disproportionality in the first place, right? Because anthropocentrists are going to say human values are superior. Maybe it's because of the fact that we have morality and maybe because we have morality and we're able to take into consideration the interests of non-human species, that makes human beings uh, more valuable. Maybe it is, again, even if we can't justify uh, the, possession of using, uh, the possession of reason by using reason, it's still a fact that human beings possess reason. What Sturber wants to show, though, is that just because we say, you know, Maybe the fact that we possess morality and that allows us for um, more consideration in terms of our moral behavior, that doesn't mean that we are allowed then to abuse and take advantage of other non-human species. So if we adopt the anthropocentric perspective, he thinks, yes, we need a human of, uh, principle of uh, we need a principle of human defense. We need a principle of human preservation, and it is the case that even from an anthropocentric perspective, we would need a principle of disproportionality. So, would we have grounds for protecting the basic needs of animals and plants against aggressive actions to meet the non-basic or luxury needs of humans? And his answer is no, because as he says, a higher degree of merit, which we could say, look, it is uh, meritorious that humans uh, possess the capability for morality, while maybe other non-human animals don't, but that higher degree of merit doesn't translate into a right of domination. He gives an example. He says, the claim that humans are superior to the members of other species, it can be just if it can be justified at all, is something like the claim that a person came in first in a race where others came in second, third, fourth, and so on. It would not imply that the members of other species are without intrinsic value, though. In fact, it would imply just the opposite, that the members of other species are also intrinsically valuable, although not as intrinsically valuable as humans, just as the claim that a person came in first uh, in a race implies that the persons who came in second, third, fourth, and so on are also merit are, are uh, also meritorious as the person who came in first.
So he thinks these three principles of human uh, self-defense, human self-preservation, and the principle of disproportionality are principles that have to be shared by both anthropocentrists and non-anthropocentrists. And this means that their, their practical course of action actually can be unified. Now, some of the, 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 the implications of this is that in the past, he thinks, Failure to, failure to recognize the importance of a principle of human defense and a principle of human preservation has led philosophers to overestimate the amount of sacrifice required by humans, right? That it might require that uh, if we are to take into account the interests of non-human animals, it might mean that human beings have to, you know, go back to living in mud huts. It might mean that human beings have to forgo, um, you know, maybe certain types of clothes, um, shoes, um, live in, you know, the 11th century, um, something like that, right? That we have to give up civilization. He's trying to argue that is not the case, right? It means that human beings simply cannot engage in, in um, the celebration and use of non-basic luxury goods. He also thinks that a failure to recognize the importance of a principle of disproportionality by anthropocentrists has led philosophers to underestimate the amount of sacrifice of humans. That humans do actually have to do more with respect to the environment. That it is not justifiable to continue the practice of factory farming and mass slaughter of animals. It is not morally justifiable to continue um, maybe, uh, you know, urban sprawl and taking out more and more land, pushing more and more animals out of their natural habitat. Instead, right, it requires, again, not necessarily giving up of civilization, but building smarter, maybe in cities, right? Being more densely populated, doing things like that. And so for Sturba, the three principles of human defense, human preservation, and disproportionality strike the right balance between concerns of human welfare and the welfare of non-human nature. Not so fast, however. Brian Steverson thinks that Sturba's supposed reconciliation uh, is celebrated too quickly. He's going to begin this objection by asking, which kinds of human needs fall into the class of basic needs? Because that's an important point for Sturba, that one is allowed to aggress against non-human animals if it's required for, again, you know, defense and self-preservation, so for the basic needs of human beings. But what actually are those basic needs of human beings? There's going to be debate. And Steverson says that the non-anthropocentrists will likely have a narrower account, so we'll say there are less things that are basic needs, then the anthropocentrist who likely say there are more things that are a basic need. Some practical implications of this, right? Sturba talked about vegetarianism, but why wouldn't veganism actually be um, required? It's unclear why if one can survive on a vegan diet, then wouldn't vegetarianism, uh, you know, with, with the consumption of animal products like uh, butter um, and milk, wouldn't that actually be engaging in a luxury good that's not a basic human need? What about degrowth versus growth-based economics? What is the basic need of human beings? Is it perpetual growth to constantly um, continue to try and produce more and more goods? Or do we actually need to scale down our economies and stop um, you know, what capitalism requires, which is infinite growth? So could you have a capitalistic uh, perspective, or would it necessarily have to be an anti-capitalist perspective as a result of um, saying that, uh, uh, you know, one is only uh, able to aggress against non-human animals in order to fulfill the basic needs of human beings. It is not the case, Steverson argues, that the anthropocentrist must be committed to the principle of disproportionality. He says, the anthropocentrist could offer plausible arguments for holding the view that in certain kinds of cases, it is actually worse to avoid aggressing against the basic needs of members of non-human species in order to satisfy non-basic human needs than it is to satisfy the latter. And finally, 
If a possession of interests is a function of the presence of the capacities of rational autonomous behavior, self-consciousness, and a sense of psychophysical identity over time, and one attaches moral significance to then the possession of those interests of self-consciousness and a sense of psychophysical identity over time, then one could actually argue that sufficiently large differences in those interests has moral importance, such that Sturba's argument that um, you know greater merit doesn't mean greater moral worth, Steverson's not so sure about that. There are many reasons to deny that claim. One could then reasonably argue that the interests of humans should be afforded greater moral weight. And I'll end Steverson's objection uh, with this quote. He says, As mentioned at the outset, reconciliation projects such as those of Sturba and Norton are fueled by the belief that when one moves beyond abstract axiological debates about the value status of non-human nature relative to that of humans, one will discover that such debates have little or no effect on the formation of general principles by which to shape environmental policy. It would be quite nice and quite philosophically convenient if this were true. If it were true, then environmental ethicists could turn their attention to the admittedly more pressing issues of policy formation and environmental management and, with great hope, reach some consensus as how to proceed. However, the hope that foundational axiological differences might disappear at the level of policy formation, or even at the level of general principles to guide policy formation, reconciliation or convergence argued uh, for by Sturba, is too easily purchased. All it requires is an underestimation of the seriousness with which the non-anthropocentrists may hold to the belief in species equality, and a corresponding underestimation of the self-interested latitude which the notion of differential intrinsic value affords the anthropocentrist. Though, for practical reasons, the differentially motivated environmental groups, organizations, and movements which now crowd the scene may have to make concessions to one another in order to achieve a politically effective level of cooperative activity that is far from amounting to either a philosophical or operational reconciliation. So as much as we might want to say, look, practical policy is of the utmost importance. It's the pressing issue with respect to the environment. We still cannot neglect these uh, abstract, deep theoretical questions. And differences in theoretical points of view are not something that can just be easily dismissed in favor of um, you know, trying to focus on those practical pressing issues. Because those differences in theoretical beliefs necessarily affects those proposed programs of action. So I want to end with this discussion question. Do you think reconciliation between anthropocentrism and non-anthropocentrism is possible as Sturba argues? Do the practical consequences of environmental policy trump theoretical differences? Or are the theoretical differences between the two camps important in their own right?